Victor, you know, we don't call ourselves uh, football experts here, but we know some things about football, but we didn't play in the NFL. Our guest here, you know, has the luxury of knowing that NFL knowledge for eight years, Victor, introducing Kirk Morrison, former NFL standout, now doing a Rams radio post game, halftime, pregame show. You do it all, Kirk. Uh, Kirk, like I mentioned, we don't have the knowledge like you. So how you doing, man? <laughs> no, man, y'all got plenty of knowledge, dude. Y'all see the same thing that I see, but you know what? Great to try to bring some of the uh, expertise that you think that I have. I guess I will uh, bring some of it today. <laughs> well, you know, I'm going to call myself out, Kirk, because yeah. I am no expert because I thought your background was a legit <laughs> library. And I, so I don't know what's going on with me today. So I'm going to take the yeah. on that one. Yeah, that's for it's the people okay. who are watching. Look at that. Look at that. That thing, yeah. Yeah, that's just a little backdrop. I got a shout out to my guys over at L.A. Banner Printing downtown Los Angeles. They know what's up. They took care of me. So uh, it makes it look good. It makes me look very studious. Yeah, you are. You, you, don't, you don't need to fool anybody. We know you know the game of NFL and, and everything all around. Right. And you're, you're a busy guy, too, man. You're doing TV, ESPN, college football. Yeah. Uh, I guess I'll start with that. How's all that grind of doing Rams radio and then being on TV and you know, going to college football games on the weekends? How's that uh, going for you this season? <laughs> Uh, the travel can get a little tiresome at times, but I, I love it, man. This is uh, it, it's always what I wanted to do. Uh, growing up, I wanted to be a broadcaster, um, and and obviously an NFL player. But uh, when I got done playing, this is immediately what I wanted to do. I actually was doing it while I was in college. So when I got the opportunity after I retired, it was a no brainer for me. But I, I love it. I enjoy it, especially I enjoy being able to cover some of these guys in college and watch them as they become pros and see how they bring their game to the to another level or and go to the next level. So it's that's that's the fun part of seeing a guy who comes in as a freshman and then four years later he's being called in the first round of the NFL draft or the fourth round, fifth round, whatever it may be, but carving out a niche for them in the National Football League. That's that's the fun part of my job. Yeah, it's very cool that you've been doing it since your college day days at San Diego State, you know, go Essex, right? Uh, Kirk yeah. there. <laughs> and then the, the other part of it, too, I think you probably enjoy, uh, Victor, I know I'm kind of going a little long when they hear with the questions, but no, I just you saw your, uh, your your Twitter profile and you had a video uh, with Odell Beckham after he won the Super Bowl. So I'm guessing that right. part of the journey, too, where, you, you know, he was trying to figure out in New York, he's a star, but all he wants right. to do is win that championship. And for you to be on the field to talk to a guy like OBJ, I'm guessing it's a, a sweet part of the gig, too. Yeah, that that's one of the parts that I, I really enjoy for me. Uh it's been about, I think, seven years now, seven years I've been able to cover uh, the Super Bowl. And, you know, once the season is done with, in terms of the regular season, uh, I cover the playoffs for Sirius XM NFL Radio. And so you kind of go on a journey with some teams for about three, four weeks in a row. You go to a divisional game, uh, then you go to the championship game, and then from the championship game, you, you meet them at the Super Bowl on the media night. And then you have the availability of players throughout the week uh, during Super Bowl week. And then finally, you get to interview the winning team on that Sunday after the Super Bowl. So for about about three weeks to a month, you've kind of developed a relationship with a lot of guys who you probably didn't know before. But now, you know, and the guys who you already knew, you've seen them. And so you watch this journey and how it takes place. And then finally, it's like the the end of it all and hoisting that Lombardi trophy and getting guys in that raw emotion. Um, I was lucky enough because the actually the action was actually happening on the field that day and when the Super Bowl was over. And I just so happened to be on the sideline and Odell Beckham had ran straight to his family and friends. And I was like, well, I got to go get this. And I came over to him and, you know, we had a quick interview. It was a quick talk. And he was just like, man, this is everything that he could dream of. I know he would probably never, ever remember that interview, but it was the raw emotion that you mentioned, Gil, that just. It's, uh, you know, that's one of the best things about sports, man. Seeing guys accomplish a goal uh, of, a, of a team. It's it's amazing. Yeah, I had to bring it up because I, I heard the interview when, when I was checking out your, your Twitter bio. And I'm like, oh, that's, that's some raw emotion right there. Yeah. You really felt the passion coming out. So that was very cool to, for you to be there to catch that moment, Kirk. But uh, you know about the magic right last year for the Rams. You know, you know they're going back to Tampa Bay where they had a special game last year in the divisional round. Right. Mm -hmm. But this year's team is very different, Kirk. Uh, you've been around there. I see you on Sunday at SoFi Stadium. We have a little hello, goodbye, because you're busy, man. You got to keep going, keep <laughs> moving. Uh, but what surprised you the most about this Rams start? They're three and four. Uh, and if you want, because we're always talking about it, you can focus on, on, on the offensive line, you can focus on the offense. But right. what surprised you the most about this poor start for the Rams? 
I think what surprised me the most is that they don't have an identity yet. Uh, they've played seven games and they don't have an identity. Well, I guess they can say they have an identity. It's been for me, it's been Cooper Cup or bust. That was what the offense was about. And that identity for me, I knew it wouldn't work because you need more than one guy to give you production, especially offensively uh, and, and defensively. And after a while, we saw that teams are willing to give Cooper Cup 15, 20 catches a game. But as long as you keep him out of the end zone or you keep the other players from getting off, the Allen Robinsons and, um, you know, now Van Jefferson has returned, Skoranek, Higby, the running backs. I mean, that's really, for me, what I've seen and, and what I've been shocked about. I think the, the one aspect of it, fellas, that I'm not shocked about, and it just kind of further reiterates the point, I don't care what sport you play, just how difficult, man, it is to repeat as a champion. I don't care if it's the NBA, Major League Baseball, college football, college basketball. I mean, we can go MLS. Just think about how difficult it is for an organization to repeat as a champion. Because number one, other teams are going to pluck all your best players. Number two, the added motivation that other teams have to go out and beat you, dethrone you, right? They that that makes their season of okay, I can't wait to play the Rams this week. Ooh, they're the Super Bowl champions. So you have that added, but then on, on the, the, the bigger part, I always say is that can a team find that same hunger, that same hunger that drove you there, like the same motivation that pushed Matthew Stafford of he can't win a playoff game. Oh, he can't do this. He's a bust in the playoffs, or he, he's never had a real moment. Or Andrew Whitworth, who was there, now retired. Can he finish it? Odell Beckham, you just mentioned Odell Beckham. Or even Von Miller, who went to that mountaintop and been trying to get it back ever since Peyton Manning left while he was in Denver. So it was so many factors for me last year that this team pushed him to the playoffs and then in, on the way to a Super Bowl that I think that they don't have that same fight, that same hunger after getting to the mountaintop, right? And so that's probably... The bigger reason why you mentioned what's the difference between last year's Rams team and what's going on with them currently this season. Uh, Kirk, you you uh, going off of what you just said, right. they didn't make any trades during the deadline right now. Uh, and looking right. at the roster, should they just uh, reset and then look forward to next year? Or should you do you think this is a playoff roster as constructed right now? Yeah, I, th I think this is still a playoff roster. They just got to find who they are, wh wh their identity. I think that you can't look at them not making a trade during the trade deadline and say they're not, they're not trying to get better. I think for the Rams, it was really more about getting healthy. I mean, they hadn't been healthy since week one. I mean, you lose your center, Brian Allen, and he finally returns um, last week. You lose Troy Hill, he finally returns. Van Jefferson, even though he was active and he played, didn't get a target. <laughs> On Sunday. So just getting him back in the mix, couldn't that help out the offense? And oh, by the way, nobody wanted Cam Akers. So could that be a big blow to his ego a little bit that no team wanted to trade for Cam Akers? Could he say, you know what? I got to prove to people that I'm a number one back in this league and I'm eligible for a contract after this season as well. And would somebody else or the Rams forget about what's happened so far? Could he be the lead back? for the Rams going forward. So there's a lot to me that says there's still a lot of talent on this team. And when you look around the NFC outside of the Cowboys, Minnesota Vikings, and obviously the undefeated Philadelphia Eagles, I think you just got to get in the tournament. The Rams have the ability to get into the playoffs. And we saw last year that two number four seeds last year, fellas, I repeat two number four seeds went to the Super Bowl in Cincinnati and Los Angeles and with the Rams. So to me, if that's still the case this year, you just got to just retool what you got, bring that fire, bring that hunger, and get to the playoffs, and you can have anything happen once you get there. Yeah, Kirk, these are some great points because like a lot of the teams you mentioned who are at the top of the standings in the NFC are very unproven with some young quarterbacks. Correct. And mm -hmm. look at the, look at the Buccaneers and, and, and the Rams. If they find a way to get in, a lot of experience yeah. with Tom Brady and Stafford, and they can maybe you know go far. Uh, but before we get to the, the big matchup, Kirk, I'm just very curious right. because uh, a lot of frustration from Rams fans on the defensive side is the yeah. Raheem Morris zone heavy, soft zone scheme. And for the most part, it, it does its job. It limits the big plays, keep everything in front of you. 
But yes. a lot, after it kind of fell apart with the 49ers, Ram fans are very, very frustrated. I just want to get your point here as a linebacker. You've done it for eight years in the NFL. Uh, right. You know this game very well. What do you think about this, especially in the NFL, because of this two-shell Big Fangio-inspired scheme is very heavy. And Raheem Morris doesn't just stick to that, but he just has a, a way of kind of, you know, going with the zone, but finding different ways to tweak it. But from your point of view, do you like this approach or should it be kind of changed up from a week to week basis? Well, I, I like this approach and it's who you are. You don't want to go in having multiple game plans or of things that um, you want to do, because now it starts to get people, um, you know, mixed up a little bit. Who are we? Um, the one thing I've learned as a defensive player is always it's not about them. It's about us. Hey, we get to communicate. We get to make our assignments and checks and things like that. The offense, they're going to go out and run their plays, but we're defense. We should be ahead. I think when you also look at the Rams have lost to the 49ers eight consecutive times, okay, in the regular season. Like, it wasn't all on Raheem Morris. I mean, Wade Phillips got a couple of those as well. I think a lot of teams got a couple of those as well. I mean, you look at last year, they beat Joe Barry and the Green Bay Packers in the playoffs. I mean, the 49ers, let's just be honest, is a really good football team. I think what's really been uh, the case for the Rams, and obviously due to reports, like, and I'm just reporting what I've saw so far, the Rams sort of tell on themselves by what they do. And to me, they told on themselves by trying to, and this is just a rumor, uh, acquiring Brian Burns, a defensive end from the Carolina Panthers. That told me the same thing I think that you see just as much as I see, right, fellas? They don't have a pass rush consistently outside of Aaron Donald. I mean, Leonard Floyd, welcome to 2022. He got his first sack last week, but that's not enough. They need someone else, and that person last year was Von Miller. So when people ask, how are the Rams this year compared to where they were last year at this time? Well, Von Miller came in, and he was a force. He was wrecking teams, and then he wrecked, obviously, in the playoffs and in the Super Bowl. I mean, he literally was, I thought, what put the Rams over the edge defensively, and OBJ was what did it offensively. What have the Rams done this year to push themselves over that point? Now, offensively, they don't have it right now, but defensively, very, very. It's just think about it. Jalen Ramsey and and also uh, Bobby Wagner is up there in your team leaders in sacks. Like this is the middle linebacker and also your corner cannot be toward the top of the team lead when it comes to sacks. That just shows you they're looking for some outside pressure. They thought it would happen with Hollins and and um and and and, and Lewis. It just has not been. And obviously Leonard Floyd may be coming along fully healthy, but the Rams told on themselves by trying to acquire brian burns from the carolina panthers that they need some sort of more of a pass rush yeah and i wonder if they went for bradley chubb or tried at least he went chubb, to miami yeah, he tried yeah <laughs> that would have been nice for them but it, it right. felt like it, all the the trade chips that they gave up in previous trades they finally ran out of ammo it felt like because there, right. there was, it was some crazy trades today you know and to keep it real right. a lot of first round picks and the rams don't have any but you're mm -hmm. right they, they they told them to, they said you know what this pass rush here is not that good and when when you're Raheem Morris and your scheme is based on rushing four, not right. they're blitzing more because they got to make it work somehow. But that's where it really starts. Rush four and make your guys like your Jalen Ramsey dudes and, and Bobby Wagner do what they got to do uh, in the back end. But Kirk, that brings me to the big matchup because uh, J Jimmy G is a quick thrower. He just gives it to the guys in space. Right. Uh, but another guy who does a little more than that, uh, but also <laughs> a very quick trigger is Tom Brady. He's a master at that. I feel right. like to get the ball off. Uh, what do you see from this matchup with with the, a, a funky kind of Brady Bucks offense? But they're in Tampa Bay, they're playing right. desperate. They still have Mike Evans and all those guys over there. What do you expect from uh you know like a Justin Hollins and Terrell Lewis? What can they do against Tom Brady? Wow, I think the, the biggest thing for them is they got to make him uncomfortable, and I think that's what teams have been doing all season long against Tom Brady, making him uncomfortable, uh, making getting to him in the pocket. Remember, their offensive line is a little bit beat up and battered similar to how the Rams offensive line was a couple weeks ago. Now the Rams at the offensive line played okay this past weekend. They only gave up, I think a couple sacks and more so on the obvious passing downs. But uh, I look at Tampa Bay's offensive line and they've lost a couple of guys last year, obviously to free agency. Then you lose your starting center, Ryan Jensen early in, uh, in training camp. This has been the, the tough part about their team is because they also have the ability to run the football, and yet Leonard Fournette has been very inconsistent. Maybe not necessarily him, but the blocking up front or teams have really committed to making this team one-dimensional and have said, you know what, we'll let Tom Brady beat us, but we won't let Leonard Fournette in that running game 
beat us as well. And that's why we saw last week just Leonard Fournette didn't have a big game. And obviously, you know, you get Tom Brady, who was very, very frustrated, right, trying to make some plays against that Baltimore defense. And Lamar Jackson took over. So I think really the big thing is we can point to Tom Brady. But I think the bigger issue when it comes to Tampa is their defense. They are not the same defense anymore. Watch. And then look on top of that, they lost Shaq Barrett, man. He's going to be out this week. He's their outstanding defensive end and he's gone with a torn Achilles. So now you're trying to figure out how does this defense, Todd Bowles and his defense figure out how to get pass rush for the Ram, I mean, against the Rams. And then also try to cover when you've got Cooper Cup. This is where, remember, Van Jefferson had his breakout game a couple seasons ago in Tampa. So I think instead of looking at the Tom Brady and their offense, it's how can they fix their defense? If they're able to fix their defense, they have a lot more opportunities to win football games. But this just is not the same defense. And I say, I mean, Baltimore Ravens came in, just ran for over 200 yards in that second half. If I'm the Rams, I'm looking for that same recipe. And so can Sean McVay cater his offense to what Baltimore did? Not necessarily the same players and plays, but the commitment to running the football. I don't care if we have to, I mean, if we need to throw it, let's just be who we are. Let's be stubborn for one day. That's what I always challenge McVay. Can you be stubborn? Can you, when the numbers are there or the loaded box, I mean, I tell you, tell me the Baltimore Ravens don't care if you put 11 in the box, we're going to run it. We don't care how many guys you're there. That's what I hope and expect from Sean McVay because that's how I think he can get this offense back in rhythm. Yeah, Kirk got into a bunch of stuff that we've talked about, Gilbert. So, uh, <laughs> and, we, and I was going to ask you about if the if the offense if if the problem with the Bucks is their offensive line and why they haven't been explosive. But these teams seem to mirror each other, and I yeah. guess the big difference here is the fact that now the defense isn't as good as it's been for the Bucks. So I'll ask right. you this in terms of the of the Bucks offense. Is it is it just the offensive line that stuck here for them or or is there more to it? And then one and one other question in terms of the offensive line. Why do you think McVeigh has been so stubborn and won't run the ball? Because that's something we've asked on here for about four or five weeks now <laughs> is 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 run right. the ball McVeigh and he just refuses to yeah, I'll start with the latter question first. Uh, he just refuses to run the football. I think a lot of times is because um, he just gets into a situation in which, you know, it, it's numbers, right? It's analytics. Analytics says if you put eight, nine guys in the box, then you should go out and pass it. When there's less than nine or less than seven guys in the box, then you should run it then. To me, I, th I feel like running the football, it doesn't matter. And I thought the San Francisco 49ers do a good job is because they throw so many screen passes as well. Well, to me, screens are the same thing as a pass. I mean, sorry, same thing as a run. I remember how a guy used to always tell me this, man. It was funny. He always said, what's the difference between a five-yard run and a five-yard pass? So there's, there's no difference. It's the same thing, right? It's still five yards. So how can you get some easy throws that simulate a run play? And that's what I think the Rams should do, get into those – no screen plays, get the ball to their skill position players. How many times did we see a wide receiver, you know, run play last week against the 49ers, right? And that's what McCole Harbin did the week prior with Kansas City. They ran the fly sweep. I'm like, the Rams, why don't you run at least four or five fly sweeps? <laughs> yes. They didn't do it. Yeah. And so to me, yeah. in a copycat league, you got to test their edges, see if they fix the problem from a week before. If you run it twice and they fix it, you, you you know, you give Kyle Shanahan and uh, D'Amico Ryan's a thumbs up and say, good job on fixing that. And we'll go back to something different. But they never really tested those edges. So uh, that's I understand your pain, fellas, when it comes to trying <laughs> to run the football. And I think the other question you mentioned when it comes to uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and their and it was what, about their defense. Right. And how they could attack or. No, the, the question? The, about why why they haven't been as explosive. Is it just simply oh. the offensive line? And and like I said, it, they kind of yeah. marry each other because both of these teams can't run. Uh, they haven't been able to run the ball. So why is is it the same thing that the Rams have on their offense? Yeah. That why they I haven't been explosive? It's two parts on that one. For me, the Rams um, say, are a little different in the aspect of Sean McVay always tells us what that the running game has to mirror the pass, and the pass mirrors the run. So if you say that, then why wouldn't you run the ball more to help you out with the pass? 
But if you're not running the ball effectively, it doesn't make the pass effective because you can't mirror a run that's not effective for a pass. So teams are able to play a little bit further back, play off, play a little more zone and dare you to run the football. And I think that's the part that hurts. Now, on the opposite side, when you talk about the Buccaneers, they have not been explosive. And one of the reasons why, I mean, they haven't really been healthy too at the t- at, at, at the uh, wide receiver position you've missed out on julio jones a couple times obviously mike evans is going to be mike evans but they haven't been able to protect too long enough right that's the one thing it's one thing to get down the field but can you protect long enough and i truly brought this up a couple days ago too and people don't really realize this but i really do the whenever you uh are are in a game or something's not working you just kind of go to your go-to Right. When the Rams and if everything is not working, it's still going to be Matthew Stafford to Cooper Cup. Right. I really believe that in Tampa Bay, everything has been going wrong, but yet there was no Gronk to make it right. Okay. I think Rob Gronkowski, his, uh, you know, retiring, not being available, that's really what's hurt Tom Brady, I think, because if it was a situation, he and Gronk had the nonverbal communication, Brady would put it in there and, Gronk didn't have to have eight or 10 catches a game, but man, he would have two or three critical third downs that can keep the chains moving. And all of a sudden you're scoring points or you're scoring touchdowns at the end of that drive. Those are the plays. I think the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are missing out on. They haven't been this, that explosive offense this year, but I I doubt that they really are that explosive still with guys who is in and out of the lineup, but more importantly, not being able to block up front and get the ball up the field. That's the reason why we've seen Tom Brady throwing tablets and, uh, you know, trying to fire up his <laughs> offensive line on the sideline. That's a good point, Curry. I didn't even think about the, the whole Gronk yeah. factor because at least with Stafford, he has a security yes. blanket and, and cup, and it's predictable, but at least you get you move some, the, the chains a little bit. Uh, but either way, it hasn't been getting the job done for, for either team. Uh, mm-hmm. But, Kirk, I know you're, you're very busy. Uh, hopefully, you don't get too mad at me here for getting a greedy extra question. No, nah, man, you're but, good, man. <laughs> okay. I, if you have any, if you want to share, do you have any stories about playing against Tom Brady? Wow. I mean, one of my, my, one of my best stories I've ever had was that my first NFL game was against Tom Brady. Um, I was a rookie in Oakland with the Raiders 2005, and my first game is in Foxborough. You know, Thursday night football, you know, that opening game is played on Thursday night. And here they are. They just came off the Super Bowl beating the uh, Philadelphia Eagles. And at the time I come in, I was the nickel linebacker. So I came in in the obvious passing situations, more second, third down type of things. And I wasn't in the base package just yet. And when I came out, I mean, you know, game starting and the starting linebacker in the base package came out and literally like the first drive, he messed up on a coverage and coach, you know, grabs him, gets him out of there said morrison you're in and so next thing you know i'm in i'm in the base package i'm right there and i always remember going out there on the field i'm at you know gillette stadium and it was like my surreal moment because i'm looking across you know the 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 line of scrimmage and if that dude number 12 wearing the helmet you know the little eye black and then him literally looking me in the eye and i look at him and he says, hey, 52 is the mic. I'm like, oh, shit. Hell yeah, that's me. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, that is me. And that's like my moment, man. And obviously, I've known him for a, a long time. I've been, you know, he grew up in Northern California where I grew up. And being able to, after that game, you know, I went out, led the team in tackles, just being able to compete. And you really don't realize it when you're in the moment. But when out of the moment, you're like, oh, wow, this is, that's pretty cool, man. You know, playing against Tom Brady and then, after the game is over, you know, shake his hand, say, "Hey, man, nice to meet you, Co- I mean, uh, Tom Brady. Uh, you know, big fan of your game." And says, "I know who you are, man. Good job, man, NorCal." And I'm like, "Wow, you know, like just, Tom Brady knows who you are." But it goes to show you just how much of a, you know, historian he is of the game. And I had a chance to play against him again a couple years uh, when I was in the, uh, you know, the AFC East with the Buffalo Bills. And you know, I've got a chance to beat him uh, a time or two in my career. But for the most part, man, it just no lead was safe with Tom Brady. And I remember once we went up in Buffalo, I believe we were up 21-7, and we're driving to make it 28-7. I think we fumble the ball inside the 10-yard line. They recover, and literally they went on like this, I want to say 35-0 to zero run. <laughs> and it was just like, how did that happen? You know, here we are on the doorsteps of possibly upsetting the Patriots again in my career, and yet 
we just couldn't get it done because we lost our opportunity. So a lot, a lot of good memories for Tom Brady. A lot of good memories I talked about with Rob Gronkowski as well. That mm -hmm. that chemistry those two had, and so that's why I really believe that those two not together this year has an effect on that offense because you can go and double team Mike Evans. You can go and double team on the outside to Godwin if you need to. If they're not running the football well, that's good. But I've always said the one mismatch that Tom Brady has always had was having one of the best blocking and catching tight ends and maybe one of the best tight ends ever in the National Football League and Rob Gronkowski. Not having him has really been, I think, something that the offense uh, has missed out on, and I miss competing against those guys. Yeah, Kirk, I appreciate all the knowledge and insight on this matchup and the stories you just shared. That was some great stories about uh, you against Tom Brady. And as always, I, I, I really just, you know, being so helpful and generous with your time here, you know, on the podcast that I have here, with Victor and Fernando, all of that. And it's great to hear you on the radio, too. There's times where, you know, I'm driving. Like, oh, there goes Kirk, man. Uh, <laughs> I on ESPN LA. So check him out. Check him out, Kirk. Uh, you, you do a great job. And also college football on TV. Is there anything you want to promote before I let you go, man? Uh, I guess UCF at Memphis this uh, Saturday here. Be uh, on at 1230 on the West Coast on ESPN, too. So I can't wait for that matchup. A top 25 UCF team uh, going against the Memphis Tigers down in Memphis. So there excited for that one, man. Check it out. ESPN 2, 1230 on Saturday. That's a busy man. Kirk Morrison. Appreciate <laughs> the time, man. Hey, sounds good, Gil. I appreciate it, fellas. You got it.